Tonight's presentation, System Awareness. And our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated. He's also an author for numerous aviation publications, uh, certified flight instructor certificate holder, A&P mechanic certificate holder, IA privileges, uh, aviation maintenance technician of the year. Uh, gosh, going back all the way to 2008 now, Mike. Uh, I've been doing this a while. And of course, a member of EAA. Mike, thank you so much for being with us. Kicking off our new year, year here, 2023. Um, I'm going to turn control the presentation over to you. Happy New Year, everybody. Hopefully, you'll be able to see my slides. Looks good, Mike. Okay, very good. Very good. Uh, well, the presentation tonight uh, called System Awareness was <clears throat> actually prompted by um, uh, by a little news report I saw a few months ago um, about uh, an aircraft incident um, happened on uh, August 26th of this year, or well, last year, sorry. <laughs> um, we just changed gears and uh, uh, involved a, a young uh, CFI uh, who uh, took off in a Cessna 172 from Monterey, California, um, not very far from from where I am, uh, on a discovery flight. Um, the, he had aboard uh, two passengers. It was a young couple. Um, the the guy was uh, in the left front seat, and uh, the woman was uh, seated in the back, and the CFI was in the in the right front seat where. CFIs typically sit, um, and this was a this was a, a thirty minute discovery flight. Um, apparently, the first time these these uh, this couple had had been up in a small airplane. So the the uh, we took off from Monterey, leveled off at thirty five hundred feet, um, headed up the coast, and at uh, at that point, he turned controls over to the uh, uh, to the gentleman in the left front seat um, and started giving him some kind of basic instructions uh, about how to use flight controls and so on. And um, uh, the flight, uh, this is a, uh, a flight aware uh, track of, of the flight, took off from Monterey, headed up the coast uh, north and then and then uh, uh, headed to, to the west, uh, basically following the, the contour of the, uh, the coast of Monterey Bay. Uh, got up to the Santa Cruz area up at the north end of Monterey Bay. Um, based on the ground track, they, they started doing some, uh, some uh, air work and, and maneuvers. And at that point, uh, it was sort of the time was up, and uh, so they uh, turned around and they started heading back down the coast uh, towards Monterey. <clears throat> uh, but not long after they departed the Santa Cruz area, uh, headed for home, uh, the CFI sensed that there was something wrong, that the engine was losing power. He looked at the tachometer, and uh, the tachometer had, had lost some RPM. Um, so he, uh, well-trained CFI, he went through the memory items on, on his loss of power checklist, uh, you know, pitch to best glide speed, mixer full rich, primer lock, carburetor heat, carburetor heat on, a fuel selector on both. Uh, none of these things helped. The engine continued, uh, to, uh, lose power and lose RPM. <clears throat> and it was obviously, uh, uh, the engine was was clearly failing, um, and at this point, um, for the first time, um, the uh, CFI looked at the engine instruments uh, other than the tachometer, and he noticed that the oil pressure gauge was reading zero. Um, he, he really hadn't hadn't noticed that before, but uh, this was not a good sign. Uh, the flight had been in contact with uh, with approach control, NorCal approach that that handles um, 
traffic up in the Northern California area. And so we told the controller, uh, NorCal approach controller, that he had an engine emergency. Uh, the approach issued him a vector to the nearest airport, which was Watsonville, uh, the identifier WVI. It was roughly 10 miles um, uh, ahead of him. Um, and at this point, um, the prop stopped. <laughs> uh, the engine ceased. And um, uh, so the, the CFI attempted to restart the engine. Uh, he's sitting in the right seat. He leans over all the way to the left to turn the key to the start position. Um, but when he tried activating the starter, the, the, uh, he was only able to get the prop to twitch very slightly. Uh, and, you know, keep in mind that the engine had seized. There's no oil pressure. Um, but for some reason, the CFI continued to try to restart the engine. Um, and he kept doing it until basically the, the, he ran the battery down. And uh, at this point, the airplane went into a total electrical failure. Uh, all the avionics shut down. Uh, of course, the, the engine wasn't turning, so the vacuum pump wasn't turning. So the vacuum-driven uh, attitude indicator uh, started rolling over and dying. Um, and then at uh, this point, uh, the CFI, having run down the battery and unable to restart the engine, turned his attention back to flying and realized that there wasn't any possibility of him making uh, Watsonville. Uh, so he started looking for a plan B to put the airplane down. Um, his first thought was to put it down on Pacific Coast Highway, Highway 1 that was more or less under him. But when he looked down, he realized that uh, there was um, lots and lots of traffic uh, on Highway 1. There were a whole bunch of uh, overpasses uh, uh, over Highway 1. And he concluded that the chances of making a uh, successful forced landing on, on the highway uh, was very unlikely. So he concluded that his best chance was to um, um, to turn to the west and uh, and put the airplane down on the beach. Um, this was not very good beach weather, so the beaches were not very populated at that point. Uh, but the problem was that uh, that the marine layer was uh, uh, was covering the beach with low clouds, which is kind of the standard standard weather pattern um, in, in, in that area. Uh, the whole Monterey Bay area gets lots of, of, of low clouds uh, uh, over the, uh, the, the coastal area. So this was going to be kind of interesting. He's got no avionics. He's got no attitude indicator. But what he does have is he has an iPad running for flight. And he also has um, a, a Stratus uh, ADS-B receiver that, that has an, an internal um, uh, attitude uh, and heading reference system, a solid state uh, AHARS. Uh, and the Stratus is coupled to the iPad by a Bluetooth. So he actually has quite a bit uh, just in his iPad and, and, and the Stratus. He configures his uh, the foreflight uh, display so that it displays um, a simulated instrument panel on the left hand side and uh, and the sectional chart on the right hand side and uh, using the information on his iPad, which is basically all he has, um, he uh, he turns the airplane and, and and heads for the beach. Um, it's no power, the prop is stopped, he's descending. Uh, he descends into the top of the uh, overcast at about 1600 feet, uh, using the iPad display to keep the wings level. Uh, he breaks out at 400 feet. Um, he's got a windshield full of ocean in front of him. But when he looks out the 
the left window of the aircraft, he can see the beach off to his left. So he makes a left turn. And uh, as luck would have it, he winds up making a perfect dead stick landing on the wet sand. Uh, no flap landing, of course, because uh, he's got no electric, so he can't lower the flaps. But he, he, he makes a, a very, very nice landing on this pretty much unpopulated beach. Um, here's an actual photograph from the local uh, the local paper took took this photograph of the 172 sitting sitting on this uh, deserted beach. Here's a close up of what the airplane looked like. As you can see, the airplane was unscathed. There was no physical damage to the airplane or any of its occupants. Although the woman in the rear seat was pretty much freaked out by this whole event and was telling the local reporters that she was convinced she was going to die. But um, but the airplane was OK, and the occupants were OK. And this was a remarkably good outcome under the circumstances. Um, upon egressing the airplane, the CFI noticed that there was oil all over the belly of the aircraft and oil all over the tail feathers. Um, he checks the dipstick, and uh, there's no visible oil on the dipstick. So that that's that's basically the story of this flight. It had a happy ending, but as I was um, learning about what happened here um, and listening to uh, a um, a YouTube interview that this um, this young CFI gave uh, on a on a um, a video podcast. Uh, where he was relating this whole incident, uh, some things started to bother me. Um, of course, there's a flight aware track of all this. There's a lot of information about this flight. And on, on one hand, um, I couldn't help but uh, admire how he kept his cool under pressure and he, uh, you know, w was able to make this difficult dead stick landing uh, through a through an undercast uh, that, that, that had a, a very good outcome. Um, but there were some things about his story that just that just uh, kind of bothered me a little bit. The, the, for, for one thing, the CFI is sitting in the right seat with the engine gauges right in front of him. And yet he never noticed that the engine was losing oil pressure. Um, and the first time he looked at the oil pressure gauge was when the engine was right on the verge of seizing. And what he saw in the oil pressure gauge was zero. Um, but, you know, the bottom of the green arc on, on this oil pressure gauge is the Lycoming um, 0320 engine. Uh, and the, 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 the green arc runs from 55 to 95 PSI. Normally we want to see oil pressure, oh, usually two thirds of the way up the green arc. And it should be rock solid. And certainly, if if the oil pressure drops below the the bottom of the green arc while the airplane's in flight, that's a very serious problem. Um, so I kind of wondered how how long had that oil pressure had been uh, below the bottom of the green before he he noticed it. And of course, he noticed it when it was zero and the engine was was basically on the verge of seizing. Um, but oil pressure doesn't just drop to zero. It 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 goes down um, fairly slowly. I've I've seen lots of uh, uh, of engine monitor data dumps of of uh, engines that ran out of oil and um, and and it, it's not something that happens suddenly. It happens you know fairly slowly. Um, and so my guess is that this oil pressure gauge had been down below the bottom of the green for quite some time, but it, and it was right in front of the instructor, but the instructor didn't notice it until the oil pressure was zero and the engine was on the verge of seizing. Um, and if he had noticed it earlier, you know, then maybe he could have throttled back to lower power and either prevented the engine seizure or at least delayed it. Um, maybe if he noticed it earlier, he, he, he could have made uh, an on-airport landing at Watsonville where it was VFR instead of having to land on the beach uh, in, in basically low IFR conditions. Um, 
so the so the one thing that bothered me was that 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 he didn't notice the decay of oil pressure and, uh, and until the engine was literally on the verge of seizing. The other thing that bothered me was that once the engine seized uh, and there, there was zero oil pressure and the prop stopped, so obviously the the, the engine was in, in extreme distress. What possessed him to attempt to restart the engine and to keep attempting to restart the engine, even though clearly the starter wasn't able to to, to turn the crankshaft uh, un, until he ran the battery down to zero and basically lost all electrical power. Um, now I'm sure on, on his loss of power checklist, there is probably an item that says after you check all the other stuff, a, a, a attempt to restart. But you know, uh, under the circumstances where, where where the engine is seized and there's no oil pressure, um, it, it's clearly an exercise in futility to try to start the engine and to try to restart it multiple times until you run the battery down. It didn't make a lot of sense. And again, you know, I, I, I was visualizing this CFI, you know, leaning all the way over to the left side of the, the panel to, to try to turn the key switch and, um, you know how much precious time was lost while he was doing that 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 you know he could have been focusing on flying the airplane and so on it just it, the, that didn't make sense so both of these things bothered me the the late recognition of oil pressure and his multiple attempts to restart a seized engine that clearly wasn't about to get restarted uh and both of those things suggested to me that that his situational awareness of the aircraft systems left a lot to be desired. Now, his situational awareness with respect to aerodynamics and navigation was nothing short of superb. And certainly he deserved a lot of kudos for, for, for the good outcome you know, under very difficult conditions, no question about it. But it just seemed like his, his um, awareness of, of, of the aircraft systems um was was not nearly as good as his situational awareness with respect to the 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 flying the airplane part now you know i fully realize that that almost all pilots including me don't spend enough time looking over at the right side of the panel where the where the engine gauges are we we mostly watch flight instruments and look out the window um and so it's not really that surprising, I guess, that that the CFI didn't notice the the loss of oil pressure. It, he probably just wasn't wasn't part of his scan. Um, uh, although I'm quite sure that the, the oil pressure was down below the bottom of the grain for quite a while um, before the engine seized and the and the flight instructor noticed that the oil pressure had gone to zero. And that's why I'm convinced that every airplane needs to have um, an engine monitor that has lots of sensors, including oil pressure and oil temperature and other critical engine parameters. And more importantly, uh, an engine monitor programmable alarm thresholds uh, so that any time a critical engine parameter like oil pressure gets outside the normal operating range, uh, that the pilot gets an alarm uh, that he can't ignore. Um, you know, the green arc on, on the oil pressure gauge for Lycoming, most Lycoming engines is 55 to 95 PSI. For most Continentals, it's 30 to 60 PSI. Um, and it, it the oil pressure should never be outside of the green arc uh, when the airplane's in flight. Uh, sometimes it will, will be drop below the bottom of the green uh, when the engine is idling with hot oil, and sometimes it might be above the top of the green when the, the engine first starts with cold oil. But when the engine's in flight, uh, the oil pressure should be rock steady. It should always be in the green arc. It preferably should be somewhere in the upper third of the green arc. Um, and, um, uh, and, and any departure from 
from that normal operating range, it's a very serious problem. Um, so in my opinion, any time a parameter like that gets out of the normal operating range, the pilot should, should get both an oral and a, visib, a visual alarm um, that, that he can't ignore. So it gets his attention right away because these are, this is, these are conditions that the pilot needs to know about right now. Um, you know, as far as the, the cranking a seized engine until the batteries is depleted, uh, maybe that's, that could be attributed to a, uh, to a poorly written checklist. But mostly, I think it was just an education problem that, that it just doesn't make sense to be trying to crank an engine after it, it has seized due to a massive systemic lubrication failure. Um, it, it just, you know, it just it wasn't a sensible thing to do. Um, so, interesting thing that that I, I I found this interesting enough that I decided I was going to write an article about it, and I had no sooner sat down to try to, to start writing this article when I got a phone call. Um, this was literally maybe a week and a half after the Cessna 172 incident. I got a phone call from from uh, uh, an emergency room physician who owns a, a, a Piper Dakota, PA-28-236 Dakota. It's a, a four-place um, Piper Cherokee family airplane with a with a 235 horsepower Lycoming uh, 0540. It's, it's basically Piper's answer to the Skylane, and it's it's a it's a great airplane. I've got some time flying the Dakota, um, and this, the 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 doc uh, was calling me, and he said he was calling me because he wanted my advice about an engine change. So any anytime anytime somebody calls me and asks me for advice about an engine change, the first thing I always ask him is why they're replacing the engine, because if the answer is because the engine's a TBO, I always try to talk about <laughs> replacing the engine. But in any case, uh, when I asked this doctor why he was replacing the engine, he had a very interesting story to tell me. Um, it turns out his airplane had just come out of uh, annual inspection. Um, it was done at, at the FBO where the plane had been maintained since uh, he first bought the airplane and he was pretty good friends with the mechanics who were there. Um, and so, when when the annual was was done, um, the the doc decided he was going to take it up on a a post maintenance test flight and ask the two A and P's who worked in the shop. It was a father and son um, team who worked in the shop whether they would like to go up with him um, on the post maintenance test flight. And the mechanics said, "Yeah, they'd love to do that," um, which is is kind of fun. I, I, I always thought, you know, if I was ever made FAA administrator for, for a day, which isn't going to happen, um, one, one of the rule changes I would make very early on in my, in, in, in my tenure was, was that it would be mandatory for any IA who signs off an annual inspection to go up on the post annual test flight. But at any rate, the, these two mechanics volunteered to go up on the post annual test flight. Uh, the, the, the owner invited them and they said they'd love to go. So the three of them get in the airplane. Um, the, the father, uh, the older of the two uh, A&Ps occupied the right front seat. Um, the, the owner was in the left front seat and the younger mechanic was in the, was in the back seat. They start the engine, they taxi out, they do a real thorough pre-flight run up, everything looks normal. Um, they take off. Uh, climb up to an altitude of about 5,500 feet, um, remaining generally in the vicinity of the of the airport. Um, everything seems fine uh, until the, um, the the uh, the the dad, the older A and P mechanic, who's sitting in the right front seat, um, says over the intercom to to the owner, says says, "Hey, that oil light is illuminated. It shouldn't be." It turns out that the the, uh, the the Piper Dakota has a little 
three light annunciator panel that, uh, that's sitting on the on the pilot side of the of the instrument panel that has three lights on it. It, it has a low vacuum uh, light, it has an alternator fail light, and it has a low oil pressure light. And the oil light was illuminated. Um, so um, and 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 this annunciator panel is 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 uh, right under the glare shield, uh, right on the pilot side of of the panel. Um, but as the doc reported to me, he said that he didn't notice the oil light on until uh, A and P mechanic, who was sitting over on the right side, pointed it out to him. Um, there there was no uh, audible uh, enunciation of low oil pressure, only this light that that, that came on and, and the pilot had not noticed the light. You know, to be fair, these enunciator lights are quite small. Um, but at any rate, uh, as soon as the a and told the pilot that this oil pressure light was on, um, the, the, uh, the pilot immediately turned towards the airport, uh, told the tower that they had an engine issue and returning to the airport, the tower cleared them to land any runway. As the Dakota arrived at the downwind leg, uh, the engine seized, the prop stopped, and uh, the the Piper Dakota made a, a, a perfect dead stick landing on, on the runway uh, with no damage to the airplane. You know, managed to roll off the runway under its own inertia. Uh, the engine was completely toast. It had thrown a rod through the side of the case. Um, and uh, that's why the uh, the owner it was calling me for advice on replacing the engine. Um, and the, the, the doc said if, if, if the ANP had not noticed its oil pressure enunciator when he did, that the doc was convinced that the airport, the, the airplane would have made an off airport landing with a much less favorable outcome. Uh, as you might have guessed, since this happened on the first flight after an annual inspection, it was a maintenance-induced failure. It turns out that the younger ANP failed to properly tighten an oil hose. Um, I, I believe it was an oil hose running from the engine to the oil cooler. Uh, it vibrated loose in flight and started um, throwing all of the engine oil overboard, and that's what caused the low oil pressure and then ultimately the engine seizing and so on. Um, the mechanic immediately fessed up to his mistake. The FBO um, promised to make things right uh, for the aircraft owner, which this is obviously going to be a pretty expensive ordeal, but uh, but it, mechanic, it was the mechanic's fault and the FBO made a claim against its E&O insurance to, to cover it. So at any rate, the moral of these stories is un un unless you're fortunate enough to, to carry your IA along in the right front seat and having him looking at the engine gauges while you're focusing on flying the airplane, uh, you really need um, uh, an, an engine monitor uh, with lots of sensors and with um, programmable alarms uh, that will alert you in a way that you can't ignore any time uh, a, uh, a significant engine parameter um, gets outside of normal operating limits. Um, uh, I, I have uh, an engine monitor in my airplane. It sits over on the right side of the panel where it's not really in my scan, but it's connected to a big yellow light that's right dead center in front of me that I can't ignore. And when the light goes on, I immediately look at the engine monitor to see what is causing the alarm and, and typically take immediate action. Something like that is, is, is really important. And an awful lot of our airplanes don't have anything like that. And, and so it's easy to have something, um, some, something go wrong uh, w without uh, noticing it in a timely fashion. And, and I, I think both of these stories illustrate that uh, pretty well. So Tim, that's, that's um, all I have, a uh, little interesting adventure, <laughs> and uh, be glad to open it up for some Q&A if there is any. All right. 
couple questions so far. Yeah, great advice about the warning light uh, when you can possibly get that on your panel. What a what a wonderful thing to have to get your attention. Um, first question here from Jim: How slowly does oil pressure typically drop in minutes? Well, you know, I don't know if there's a typical, um, but but I know that I have I have uh, done analysis. You know, my my company is the probably the principal company that does engine monitor data analysis uh, for piston GA, and so I've seen a lot of of, of uh, engine monitor. Uh, data graphs of, of um, aircraft that, that lost oil pressure in flight. And, and and typically the oil pressure drops fairly slowly. Um, uh, eventually it gets down to the point where uh, where where the uh, the oil level is is right at the, at the where the, the bottom of the oil pickup tube and then the oil pump starts, Kind of sucking foam instead of liquid oil, and you can see the oil pressure oscillating up and down. Um, uh, but it 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 typically happens over a period of of many minutes, uh, not not something suddenly. Um, I mean, I suppose there there might be some scenarios where oil pressure failed suddenly, um, but that's not that. That's not what typically happens. If, if 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 the engine runs out of oil, which is apparently what happened with both of these aircraft, the 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 Dakota, we know exactly what happened. One of the oil hoses came loose. Um, uh, but you know the there there's eight or nine quarts of oil in in the sump, and uh, it takes. A fair amount of time for that much oil to get pumped overboard, uh, even with a hose off. The 172 um, did not get any information about exactly what caused the the oil loss, but obviously uh, something caused the the oil loss, and most likely it was some kind of a maintenance induced induced failure, a hose that came off, or an oil drain plug that worked its way out, or something. There's only a few ways that that can happen, not not, not too many ways. Um, but but typically it takes you know uh, some period of minutes. Uh, it's about the best I can say. And um, uh, you know the, the the few minutes can make a big difference as to whether you can land on an airport or you wind up landing somewhere else. Um, but you know, even even any instability in oil pressure when the airplane in fl is in flight is is, is uh, very significant because oil pressure should be absolutely rock solid when the airplane's in flight. It shouldn't it shouldn't vary at all. And, and there are only a couple of things that can cause oil pressure to to vary in flight, and they're all bad. Uh, you know, a, a bearing that's starting to spin can do it. Um, a metal uh, getting stuck in the pressure relief valve uh, can do it. Um, but but anything that causes oil pressure to fluctuate in flight, even even if it's in in inside the green, if it's if it's fluctuating, um, that that's pretty serious, and it would be grounds to put the airplane down as quickly as possible. And certainly, any time the oil pressure drops below the bottom of the green, um, it's a uh, it's very very serious. I I, I once talked to a, a the pilot of a of a Cirrus that that ran out of oil, and um, he it turns out he he'd been watching the oil pressure and he saw it drop below the bottom of the green. Um, and he kept flying and he, he went all the way to his destination and basically ran the engine out of oil. And, and I, I, I asked him, I, I said, you know, why did you continue the flight? Wasn't there, couldn't you have landed, landed you know, sooner once you noticed the oil pressure dropping below the bottom of the grain? And his answer was, well, you know, it, 
it, it wasn't at red line. It, 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 it had dropped below the bottom of the green into the yellow. And he didn't think that was serious. It was like, well, you know, if the, if the light turns from green to yellow, I hit the accelerator, I don't hit the brake or something. But it, uh, the oil pressure needs to be uh, rock solid. It, we normally like to adjust it so that it's maybe two thirds of the way up the green arc, maybe 50 PSI for um, continentals and 80 PSI or something for Lycomings, uh, 75 or 80 PSI for Lycomings. And it should, it should be rock solid there because it's, it's regulated by a pressure relief valve. And anything that cause it to fluctuate is, is, is a pretty serious problem that warrants um, putting the airplane on the ground as soon as possible. Good comment there. A few people were asking, what should they do if they get a low oil pressure? So I think you just answered that with your last sentence. Land. Land. <laughs> pull, uh, pull, pull the power back, first of all, to, 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 to the lowest power you can get away with. Because if the, if, if the engine is suffering uh, low oil pressure, um, you, you want to reduce the, you know, the, the, the reciprocating stress on the main bearings and rod bearings to, 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 so that the engine will, will go as long as it can without seizing. And so you'd, you'd reduce power immediately to, to the, the minimum that you need for, for a controlled descent. And then you'd find a place to land. Chris says, I have an EDM 900 in my Mooney with a light on the panel, but no audible alarm that I'm aware of. Is is that true or is there an audible alarm, he wonders? Uh, well, it probably isn't, but it's easy enough to put one in. Um, the, the, the JPI engine monitors have a, a, a an external alarm pin um, that you can hook to anything you want to hook it to. You can hook it to a light. You can hook it to a, 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 an audible device. They're generally called sun alerts uh, that, that make a noise, something like a, a gear horn or, or a stall horn. Um, or you can hook it to both. And, and actually, actually, I think, you know, the, the preferable thing to do would be to hook it to both. Um, so that you 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 can't ignore it. It, it you get a both an audible alarm and a and a visual alarm. Raman asks, with a programmable monitor uh, for non-primary instruments, do you set your alarm limits and ranges differently than the ranges in the POH? Well, you know that's an that's an interesting question. Um, the, there are two different categories of engine monitors there there are those that are supplementary and that the, there are those that are primary instrument replacement and unfortunately a lot of the ones that are that are primary instrument replacement where, where you, you put this glass thing in and you take a bunch of the original instruments out um, are certified so that the alarm limits are programmed at the factory um, rather than programmable by the user. And uh, they're typically programmed at manufacturer's red line, which is basically makes the alarm kind of useless because you, you don't want to wait until something gets to red line before you get an alarm. So for example, uh, uh, say for a continental engine, if, if we're talking about a well pressure, the, the green arc is, is uh, 30 to 60, uh, and the red lines are at 10 and 100. And it, it, a lot of the primary instrument displays, if you, if, if you get a, a primary uh, replacement engine monitor um, that has oil pressure sensor on it, they'll factory program it to, to alarm at, at 10 or 100, which is not, really what you want. You, you, you want an alarm anytime it gets out outside the green arc. Um, the, the, uh, typically, the, the supplementary engine monitors that aren't primary replacement are, are, have user programmable alarms you can set any place you want. And 
you know, personally, I think that all engine monitors should should have user programmable alarms. Um, JPI, on, on some of its uh, primary um, uh, replacement instruments uh, or replacement um, engine monitor systems, uh, has has what I think is a really good system. They actually have two different alarms. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what they call them, but I refer to them as, as red alerts and, and yellow alerts. And the red alerts are hardwired at the factory to the, to the manufacturer's red lines, but the yellow alerts are user programmable and you can set them wherever you want to. Uh, and I think that's, that's the ideal setup is, is to, uh, where, where, where you have a set of supplementary alarm that you can set wherever wherever you want them to 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 be set, um, but there are quite a few primary replacement systems that are that are factory programmed to um, uh, to the manufacturer's red lines and and are certified that way so that the manufacturer doesn't have the option of changing them to anything else. And I think that's kind of unfortunate because being alerted when you get to red line is is too late. Uh, we, we really need to be alerted when we get outside of the normal operating range. Rod gives an interesting comment. He says, a very good uh, point reference, the oil pressure being steady. He said he's used a grease pencil to mark the steam gauge glass at the normal pressure. Sounds like a great idea to me. And Mark says, how long can an engine run with no oil? I heard a Lycoming can run for some time with zero oil pressure when it's throttled back. Yeah, uh, and that that kind of goes along with what I was saying that that the, how long a, an engine can survive um, with with a systemic um, lubrication failure is really a function of, of of how much power it's it's making. It, if it's if it's operating at high power, it's not gonna last very long. If you can throttle it back um, as as far as as is reasonable, I mean, because basically what you wanna do is make a controlled descent to, to the nearest airport. Um, but if you can throttle it back to lower power, it's gonna last a lot longer. Uh, an engine can idle with no oil pressure for a long, long time without, without serious uh, damage. I mean, it'll do some damage, but it, but it won't seize. Um, but the higher the power, the the the, uh, the the more important it is to have proper oil pressure. Jerry asks, uh, making adjustments to increase the pressure is done by increasing spring pressure. Does this change the volume of oil being pumped? Um, well, higher oil pressure would increase the volume of oil being pumped somewhat. Um, and, and you're correct, the, the oil pressure is adjusted by adjusting the spring tension at the oil pressure relief valve. Uh, some oil pressure relief valves have an adjustment screw on them. Others uh, are adjusted by, uh, by inserting shim washers uh, behind the spring. Um, but either way, it's a it's a it's a relatively simple adjustment. And if the oil pressure is not um, at an optimum place, and again, I recommend adjusting it to be about two thirds of the way up the green arc. Uh, it's a very easy adjustment to make uh, at the pressure relief valve. William says, on the first engine start of the day, the oil pressure stays at zero for an uncomfortable amount of time. Is there a rule of thumb for a maximum amount of time for oil pressure to come up to the yellow or green? Um, if the oil pressure doesn't come up promptly, um, it's usually a problem. Um, that, that I'm guessing that this is a this is an older airplane uh, that that has um, an oil pressure gauge that 
is directly connected to the engine through a small capillary line. Uh, some of the newer airplanes use electrical transducers, but but most of the legacy airplanes, including the one I fly, the oil pressure gauge is what's called a Borden tube gauge uh, that, that actually has an oil line connected directly to it. It's a small diameter um, uh, oil line that runs from the gauge through the firewall to the to 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 the engine itself, and if the if the gauge comes up slowly after the engine starts, it's usually an indication problem. It's usually caused by the oil in in that line from the gauge to the engine. Uh, e either there's air in that line, or there's some really old oil that has solidified. Um, the, the the oil in that line is is captive. It it doesn't you know there's really no flow, and and so you know frequently you'll find these lines that are full of oil that that are 45 years old or something. So if the gauge is coming up slowly, usually the solution is to disconnect the line, blow it out with some shop air, fill it up with some fresh engine oil, and reconnect it and try to do it in a way that that doesn't introduce any any air in the line and magically the, the gauge will start responding promptly so my my best guess uh is is that he's dealing with an indication problem not with a real uh oil pressure problem and uh, and it's an easy an easy fix gerald says my sr22 blows out one quart of oil about every five hours should i be concerned uh no um the the continental actually says that you shouldn't get concerned until oil consumption is a quart in three hours and that it's not an airworthiness issue until it's it gets to a quart in one hour now i don't think most of us would be comfortable flying an engine that that burns a quart per hour simply because it's very embarrassing to run out of oil before you run out of fuel <laughs> But um, the, but basically the, the the official continental threshold of concern is a quart in three hours. So uh, I've seen I've seen engines that burn a quart in five hours. Uh, you know, go go all the way to TBO or or beyond without any problems. Um, there's a, a one of the possible causes of elevated oil consumption that that I frequently see with Cirrus um, has to do with with um, lead sludge buildup uh, in in the uh, in the oil control ring, um, and we have a a solvent ring flush procedure that that you can find on on the the Savvy Resources website, um, or if he drops me an email, I'll send him a link to it. Uh, but it's a procedure that, that that we use for trying to clean sl sludge out of uh, oil control rings, and will frequently improve the oil consumption issue, uh, especially on engines like the on the SR22, which is a an unusually large displacement engine with an unusually small oil sump capacity, um, and so it tends to suffer um, more than most engines from uh, sludge. Um, deposits uh, building up on on, on the rings on, on the piston rings and that can cause elevated oil consumption douglas asks is it normal for oil pressure to vary with outside air temperature and power setting uh no not not in not in flight um the oil pressure is almost purely a function of engine rpm and the oil pump is capable of producing much more oil pressure than the engine requires. So it has an oil pressure relief valve, an adjustable oil pressure relief valve that limits the oil pressure. So once the RPM is high enough that it's making oil pressure at the set point of the pressure relief valve, um, any pressure above that gets it gets bypassed by the pressure relief valve and so it should be held pretty pretty much rock steady um 
if 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 the engine is operating at flight RPMs, uh, it 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 should always be in the green and it should not fluctuate. Uh, if, if if you're talking about ground operations uh, where where you're turning much lower RPMs, then sure, um, our well pressure can vary. But in flight, it it should be uh, it should be rock solid. Craig says the two examples that you identify um, have a breakdown in scan pattern, which for me includes engine instruments. What is your recommended engine gauges scan pattern periodically? He flies a Cessna 310L. Well, you know, it 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 kind of depends, but um, if, if if for example we're we're flying IFR, um, our attention is largely going to be on scanning the flight instruments, um, and and it's be it's it's hard to 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 scan the engine instruments as often as as we really should, both because of the placement of them, which is you know away from the center of our of our scan over on the other side of the panel, um, and be, because uh, particularly if if we're flying IFR, the the flight instruments are going to be our our first priority, and that's why I th I think you know having alarms for for uh, deviations of of uh, critical engine parameters is important. Um, but if you don't have something like that, then then you definitely want to include the engine instruments in your scan, and that's something that would is going to require you know training and practice. Um, we we just it's just kind of a natural failing of of pilots to look at those things as often as 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 we should, and to 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 recognize that that things are out outside of normal limits. Michael says, I have a very low value airplane with what I always understood to be a pretty bulletproof Lycoming like 0320, but no engine monitor or EGT or CHT. I was, think of, I was thinking of putting in a CHT as a first priority, low cost investment improvement, or should I be looking at a monitor? Oh. How much would a basic monitor run me? Any specific recommendations? Yeah, the the you know you you can spend as much on these systems as you want to, uh, but the, but basic um, entry level four cylinder digital engine monitor, uh, JPI uh, EDM seven thirty or eight thirty. Um, Electronics International CGR 30P uh, Insight G2. Um, those are all probably down in the maybe two thousand dollar range. Um, and engine monitors, in my experience, pay for themselves very, very quickly because um, they give you the ability to very precisely diagnose engine problems um, uh, so that you know you can have the, have the mechanic you know change the bottom spark plug on the number three cylinder instead of having to go you know pull all the plugs and inspect them because you don't know you don't you don't know exactly why the engine is running rough uh, it, it just it it reduces maintenance cost um, Quite dramatically, and and these things almost always pay for themselves very quickly. So I would encourage. Uh, the, you know, the other thing is um, uh, th there seems to be this misconception that 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 engine monitors are are only something that is appropriate in a in a fancy high performance aircraft. But in my view, the the less redundancy the aircraft has, um, the more important it is to to have good instrumentation. You know, if 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 I have a if 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 I swallow an exhaust valve, for example, on my twelve cylinder twin, uh, 
um, I fly to my destination and I think about what's going to cost me to fix. If the same thing happens on a six cylinder Bonanza, uh, the airplane's going to land at the nearest airport and the pilot's going to change his underwear. If it happens uh, in, in a 172 with an 0320, the airplane's probably going to wind up making an off airport landing because uh, four cylinder engines don't run very well on three cylinders. Six cylinder engines run a lot better on five cylinders. Um, so, in my view, the, the the airplanes that have the least redundancy um, and, a, you know, a, a, an airplane with a four-cylinder light combing is, is, is certainly in that category. Um, th those, in my mind, are the, are, are the airplanes that, that most urgently need good in engine instrumentation so that you can see what's going on and you can get a, a very early heads up when, when something is starting to malfunction. George uh, asks, can setting the oil pressure too high cause any problems? Not really. The, 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 there, is, there is an upper red line uh, on oil pressure. Um, the, the, the only bad thing that could happen with, with high oil pressure is conceivably um, you know, a gasket or something could could blow out, but it would take an awful lot of oil pressure to do that. Uh, and and it's it's pretty common for engines to, to to make high red line oil pressure uh, in cold weather when you're starting them with cold oil and stuff. Um, but once the oil warms up. And the airplane is ready for flight. The oil pressure should should have definitely come back down into the into the green arc. Um, but it, uh, high oil pressure, it, it, the the risk of high oil pressure is minimal. Uh, it would take a lot of oil pressure to 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 blow something out. And you know, again, if the oil pressure relief valve is working correctly, it, it's not going to happen because the Oil pressure relief valve is base, basically puts an an upper bound on oil pressure. That's what it. That's what its purpose is. Mark wonders what about fuel pressure? Should the gauge read rock solid in flight, or is it okay to fluctuate? Okay to fluctuate by how much? Well, I mean, it it depends on on what airplane we're talking about, whether it's carbureted or whether it's fuel injected, but uh, the the carbureted engines typically are very insensitive to fuel pressure. Um, all they need is enough fuel pressure to to, to fill up the the, the flow bowl in the carburetor. Um, RSA fuel injected engines, which is the fuel injection system that's used on Lycomings, uh, normally has a very 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 wide uh, fuel pressure spec that the servo is happy with. Um, and continental fuel injected engines almost never have uh, have a, a fuel pressure gauge. So uh, generally fluctuation in fuel pressure is, is, is usually fairly non-critical. William asks, is your minimum oil temperature for cold starts the same as Lycoming or Continental, or do you advocate a higher temperature? I'm not aware of a, 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 a minimum oil temperature. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I always recommend preheating uh, an engine uh, when the OAT is below freezing, but um, that's really not a function of oil temperature. Uh, engines that are operating in cold weather normally are operating on in, uh, with multi-grade oil, which whose whose pourability is very good down down to very low temperatures, zero or something like that Fahrenheit. Um, so I, I'm not aware of that that there is any kind of published minimum oil temperature. Douglas asks, how accurate is the typical airplane oil pressure gauge? Do you normally use the airplane gauge when adjusting the oil pressure? 
Well, the the factory gauges um, uh, on legacy airplanes are, are, are usually not all that accurate. But on the other hand, the, uh, the 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 necessity of being super accurate is not is is not really there. We we the, the you know, the acceptable oil pressure spec is fairly wide. Like I said, 30 to 60 for Continentals and 55 to 95 for most Lycomings. It's a pretty wide range. And we're not trying to adjust oil pressure to, to you know, the nearest one PSI or anything like that. We just want it to be in the ballpark and uh, in, in general, try to, Adjust it so it, it in flight it typically runs around two thirds of the way up the green arc, but um, the, the gauges typically aren't terribly accurate, but they don't really need to be terribly accurate. On the other hand, the board and tube gauges in legacy airplanes uh, almost never fail, uh, whereas in the the electric gauges in new air newer airplanes we, we see a lot of failures of well pressure transducers and stuff but the the old board and tube gauges there's basically nothing that can go wrong with them Carol wonders if you can address the electrical parameter monitoring such as amps and volts um, sure uh, the voltage uh, the, the the only component in the airplane that is very sensitive to bus voltage is the ship's battery. Um, typically, avionics don't really care. Uh, most modern avionics, whatever the bus voltage is, the first thing that happens is it gets regulated down to five volts the minute it goes into the box. So most avionics will will operate anywhere you know between 10 and 30 volts on the bus, and they don't really care what the voltage is. Um, but but uh, lead acid storage batteries are are quite sensitive to bus voltage, and um, if the voltage is too too high, uh, the battery uh, will overheat, and it will typically boil off electrolyte, and the the life of the battery will be significantly foreshortened. If the voltage is too low. Uh, the battery will last a long time, but it won't achieve uh, its its full rated capacity. And so, if you do have uh, a charging system failure, uh, you won't have as much useful life out of the battery uh, uh, in the absence of, of of alternator power as 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 you're supposed to. So, it's important that the bus voltage be um, you know within a few tenths of a volt of what it's supposed to be um, but if it has to be off it would be better to be a little bit low than it be a little bit high because high voltage is very very tough on on the battery low voltage just means that the battery won't won't um, achieve its full rated ampere hour charge John says, can we install a, in a certified aircraft a red light warning of low oil pressure? I asked my A&P IA to do this on my mall 180 horsepower, and he said the paperwork from with the FAA is cumbersome and the local FISDO was not very helpful. Well, I mean, certainly if, certainly if you installed uh, an engine monitor um, that has as part of its FTC paperwork the ability to put in an oil pressure sensor, which most of them do. Um, th then th there's really you know no paperwork. It's it's just installing an STC device. If if you're trying to only install a low oil pressure sensor, um, you need some kind of approved data to do that. Um, and if it's not something that mall ever installed uh, then you you know you might need a field approval and that 
th that's probably the situation that your mechanic was uh, referring to. But if you inst if you install a, an, an STC engine monitor um, with a with an oil pressure sensor, then there shouldn't shouldn't be any any paperwork. It's just a normal STC installation with a 337 that gets sent to Oak City, but nobody looks at it, and it's not cumbersome at all. Drew wonders, does low oil pressure at idle or 1200 RPM indicate a worn pump or worn bearings? Um, not, not normally. If, if I mean, if the pump is if if the pump is producing proper pressure in flight, that's really all we're we're worried about. The 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 oil pressure is allowed to be far below the bottom of the green uh, when the engine is idling. Um, and, and in fact, it's not unusual for it to be extremely low when the engine is idling and the oil is hot. And, and that's not really a problem. The, 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 the engine's requirement for oil pressure when it's idling is very, very modest. Um, but it, but it, it, its requirement for good oil pressure when it's producing a significant amount of power is, is, is much more important. Daryl says our Lycoming 0360 dumps the first two of eight quarts of oil overboard through the breather tube. We now only fill to six quarts. What's your thoughts on this approach? That's perfectly normal. Um, most engines don't like to be filled to the to the top mark on the dipstick. Um, and my general recommendation for most engines is to, to service them to about two thirds of their maximum capacity. Uh, so six quarts, five, five to six quarts in an eight quart sump, um, eight quarts in a 12 quart sump. Um, if the engine is burning a lot of oil, you might wanna add an extra quart just to have a little bit more cushion. Um, but the, it, it, it's, it's a funny, uh, the reason for that is kind of a funny um, uh, certification thing. Um, the, the certification regulations for, for engines, which is part 33, um, require that the engine run properly in all normal flight attitudes with, uh, with an, uh, an oil quantity that's one half of maximum capacity. So if it's an eight quart engine, it has to be able to run on four quarts. Um, most Lycomings actually do a lot better than that. Most Lycomings will, will, will run with two or two and a half quarts. Uh, most Continentals will run with maybe three and a half quarts. Uh, it kind of depends on on the particular engine mon model, because it depends a lot on the shape of the of the uh, oil sump. Um, but you can look up uh, the type certificate data sheet for your particular engine on the FAA website, um, and in the TCDS, it, it will indicate what the amount of unusable oil is, which basically tells you how low the oil can get before the pump starts sucking foam and it by certification regulations that number has to be less than one half of the sump capacity and usually it's quite a bit less than that um, so normally if if you run the engine with a two-thirds of sump capacity you're you, you've got you've got plenty of cushion um, but it's it's a good thing to to check your particular engine to check the type certificate data sheet to find out what the you know what what the amount of unusable oil is um, so that you know what the absolute minimum that that you can run is and of course you never want to run it quite that low you always want to have a couple of quarts of, of cushion above the unusable oil level but typically most engines are, are very happy if you run them at two-thirds of maximum capacity and 
um, a lot of engines will will toss the the first quart or two out if you fill them up to the top, particularly uh, when the engine's in a nose up attitude. That typically is when it, it it's least happy with, with with having the sump filled all the way up and will toss a lot of oil out. I was wondering, uh, is there a routine test procedure for the programmable alarm limits? Uh, for example, how can you manually induce low oil pressure for a few seconds to verify that the pressure sensor and programming and ultimately the light and horn are all correctly working? Well, I mean, for example, for, for, for oil pressure, um, if you power up the engine monitor with the engine not running, the oil pressure is going to be zero. You should you should get a low oil pressure alarm. Um, and th there's not a particular easy way to verify the calibration uh, of the sensors, but normally the sensors used on engine monitors are 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 dead nuts on. They they, they almost never. Uh, have a significant error to them um, and it's certainly easy enough to 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 verify that the alarm light or the alarm horn or whatever you have hooked the external alarm that you have hooked to the engine monitor is is working um, because for example you'll you'll typically get lots of alarms if you turn on the engine monitor with the engine not running most most of the time you don't do that most of the time you start the engine then you Turn the avionics master on, and that powers up the engine monitor. But it's easy enough to power up the engine monitor with the with the engine not running, and get lots of alarms that way. John was wondering, how would you tell if you had a faulty oil pressure gauge and not an oil pressure loss problem? Well. Um, you know, like I said, the 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 Borden tube gauges, the direct reading gauges, uh, almost never fail. There's there's almost nothing that can go wrong with them. Um, but in in general, if you know if 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 you feel like you need to to check the calibration of an instrument, uh, the way you do that is you plumb an external instrument in, and and that it's quite common to to plumb an external. Uh, oil pressure gauge, a calibrated oil pressure gauge, in to uh, to check the oil pressure. Mechanics do that all the time. George was wondering, are there engine monitors for legacy aircraft? Absolutely, of course. Um, most of the supplementar, supplementary supplementary uh, engine monitors are STC'd for pretty much everything that flies. Barry says, I have an old Insight. Um, he says GEM 602. Mm -hmm. yeah. Should I consider upgrading that? Yes, you should. Uh, absolutely. Um, that that the, the gem is kind of an old boat anchor. And one of the problems with it is that it, it's no longer possible to to download data from it because it used a, some it used an infrared link that went to an old Hewlett Packard handheld computer that is no longer even available. Um, so I yeah I would definitely consider um, replacing it with uh, with something like a JPI 730. The the um, uh, I I know that. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the, the JPI can interface with the with the old gem probes and harness if they're still working okay. Uh, in which case, you'd only have to replace the instrument and not not the whole harness. I'm not sure about whether the Insight, uh, the new Insight instruments, the the G series instruments, will will play with the original gem harness. But there's probably a pretty good chance that they will. Donald that, was makes, that makes the upgrade, you know, pretty inexpensive and pretty easy. Mm -hmm. Donald was wondering what paperwork is required for installing an engine monitor, and when you keep the original steam gauges. Um, normally, normally it's an STC instrument. You just file a form three thirty seven with Oklahoma City. <laughs> 
And Nicholas says, I know that Savvy performs the engine data analysis, and would you have an example of where customer engine data indicated a developing problem that prevented a failure before it happened? Oh, goodness. We, that happens all the time. <laughs> Um, and, and in fact, you know, nowadays we've got a, a bunch of artificial intelligence algorithms that scan data as it's uploaded. And uh, we, we've got a, a program called FIVA that uses a, a, a machine learning model that, that, that provides reports on uh, exhaust valve uh, failure risk and highlights cylinders that we think ought to get a bore, bore scope stuck in because they're at, at high risk of, of having a, an exhaust valve going out. Um, I did a, a webinar, I guess it was last month, on a, a new program that we're doing called Project Gadfly, which is a general anomaly detection um, algorithm that, that uses um, uh, machine learning and neural networks to, to uh, to, to detect abnormal uh, things in engine monitor data, uh, but yeah, we I mean we we find and diagnose problems all the time with engine monitor data. That's we've got a staff of ten analysts that that that's what they do all day. Well, that sounds great, Mike. Uh, looks like we're kind of reached the end here. I think we had. Right around 600 people logged in tonight. Uh, great Excellent. opening Good. webinar for the year. Why don't you take a moment and share closing thoughts with us? Okay. Um, well, if, you, if you're not on my um, mailing list for, for our monthly newsletter and, uh, and periodic uh, maintenance stories, uh, the easiest way to get on the, on the email list is to uh, use your your smartphone and text the word savvy s-a-v-v-y to 33777 which will wake up a little uh, email bot which will ask you for your email address and add you to our our mailing list we send out a a, a newsletter a maintenance oriented newsletter uh, uh, every month usually the third week of every month and uh, in between newsletters we will periodically send out interesting maintenance stories about things that have happened to our our clients that that we think have uh, there there are some lessons to be learned from them um, my four books are available on on amazon and the eaa bookstore at aircraft spruce um, the manifesto is available as an audio book and we are um, about two-thirds of the way through uh, creating the audio version of the of the engines book uh, so that hopefully will be available within a couple months um, uh, uh, I do a, a monthly podcast with a couple of my uh, savvy colleagues uh, uh, Colleen Sterling and Paul New um, called Ask the A&P's it's a it's basically a call-in show where we spend an hour every month um, taking questions from from aircraft owners on on maintenance issues and trying to trying to solve them online so uh it's it's an interesting listen you can get it on spotify or apple podcasts or wherever you like to get your podcast it's pretty widely disseminated and if you'd like to uh, participate in the show and ask a question um uh, if you send your question to podcasts at aopa.org our uh, producer ian twombly will schedule you on for one of our recording sessions we normally record the podcast the middle of each month and then then it goes through editing and sweetening and all the stuff that they do and uh, it gets released the first of the of the next month and it's actually now available in video so we're it's both you you could get it either in audio or or on, on youtube uh, in in video, if you want to see our ugly mugs, <laughs> well, while we answer uh, questions, but we have a lot of fun with it, and I think you'll enjoy it. And finally, the the next uh, three webinars for 2023. How about that? Um, mm -hmm. The February webinar is called "Obsessed with EGT." We'll be talking about um, 
the, the right and wrong way to use EGT and why I'm not a big fan of using EGT for, for leaning. Um, the March webinar is called A Matter of Trust and it has to do with, with um, uh, whether, whether your IA can rely on on, on, on maintenance records that other IAs have made or whether they have to verify all the airworthiness items themselves. It's a, it's a kind of interesting, uh, interesting uh, subject and some interesting stories. And finally, um, in April, uh, the, the webinar is called Ethics of Misdiagnosis. Um, and it was triggered by a conversation, interesting conversation I had with a, the, owner of a, uh, of a Piper PA-12 who was having starting problems and he gave his the airplane to his mechanic and the mechanic wound up replacing a whole bunch of expensive things that didn't fix the problem. And the question is, you know, do I really have to pay him for all of that stuff since it didn't fix the problem? It started a very interesting conversation about the, the, the ethics of misdiagnosis and how to prevent spending money on on things that don't fix the problem so it's an it's going to be an interesting uh, an interesting webinar in april and um and that's all i have tim well thanks mike looks like a great lineup and just to mention that on wednesday january 25th you're going to be doing a presentation for home builders week on finding an engine for your home build so if anybody's interested in that uh january 25th sign up for that one Yep, I should have put that on the on the slide. I forgot about that, but yeah, definitely going to be participating in Home Builders Week. I'm looking forward to that. Well, thanks a lot, Mike. Great presentation as usual. And uh, to everybody who tuned in tonight, thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Happy New Year, everybody.